gentlemen, here we are once again, coming to you live from a top secret broadcasting bunker at the Hog Pen. This is Pastor Mike, and I am online, and I am live, and I am with you today. You've got me until uh, 2.30 Central Time today, which is normally how long we run. Uh, you couldn't have me Tuesday, and uh, I missed being here, uh, but something that I always have to keep in mind, something I always have to try to remember, uh, along with... Uh, the Pastor Mike Online, the Watchman Broadcast, uh, Pure Bible Study, and everything uh, that we do. I am pastor of Bethel Church, and uh, these people here have always taken good care of me, and I love them dearly, and I love them deeply, and, and I strive uh, to always do for them. They come first. Um, I've had people... Uh, who have watched this ministry that have come and gone. They show up and they say, oh, you're the greatest thing in the world. And then as soon as I say something they disagree with, they are down the road. Um, and so I've, I'm learning how to get, I'm getting used to people leaving, uh, whether it's their watchers of our ministry or whatever. Uh, or they're people in the church, but when it comes, when it all comes down to it, uh, I've got to be uh, Mr. Hoggard at home. I've got to be Lisa's husband. I've got to be my girls and my boys' dad. I've got to be Pastor Mike here to these people. And uh, you know what? I'm going to pull the volume up just a little bit. Um, I have to be pastor, and that's what I was doing Tuesday. Brady and Bradley's dad uh, had, t had taken a bad spell on Tuesday, actually Monday night, and um, they called me up to the hospital Tuesday morning, and I, I thought when I got there that um, that he was gonna he was gonna be dead, uh, but uh, you know we prayed and had a good visit with him, and just kind of stayed there with him and his family uh, pretty much most of the day Tuesday. And uh, I'll tell you, I, I love what I heard. I mentioned this last night in the service. Uh, when, a, when a guy is, uh, when he's ready to go, when he's ready to go meet Jesus, when he is, uh, when he's at that time, um, he don't care what everybody thinks about him. He's going to tell you how it is. He told some people in that room how it was and how they needed to get their life right with God. And I'm going, this guy's saved. There's no doubt in my mind about it. And so it, it ended up being a good day. He is home now. They have him. Um, uh, at, he is actually staying with uh, Bradley and uh, receiving uh, the kind of care that he really needs. And just continue to pray for that family. I promise today is going to be Ask Pastor Mike Your Question Day. And so I tweeted that earlier uh, today, just kind of let everybody know. And I see that uh, some people have already sent in some emails and whatnot, and I'm going to try to get to as many as possible today. Uh, I've got a couple things that I'm going to deal with um, uh, in immediately today. And uh, one really good question that somebody had asked me on Facebook. Um, let me see if I can try to find out. I'm, I told I told him I wasn't going to give his name, and but he's asking me, and I told him that I would be talking about this today, but I'm not going to mention his name, and um, but uh, I'm just going to kind of read a couple of little things that he's uh, that he wrote me today uh, before the broadcast started, and I felt you know what I'm going to maybe somebody else has the same situation going on in their life or something very similar to this. I know that I have run into this before. Uh, but he said everything has gone wrong uh, in a certain area of his life. And he said, though no fault of my own, I am under perpetual spiritual attacks. I've been praying so hard and asked so many people to pray for me. I really don't understand God. I love God with all of my heart, and I know that I don't deserve any good thing from God. But nothing seems to be working, and God doesn't seem to be answering me at all. I don't understand any of it. I'm now forced to, and I'm, I'm not going to read a whole lot of details here. And uh, no, he's not confessing any sin or anything like that. 
Um, but he says, it seems no matter how hard I try to do something with my life and to make a success of things, the more I fail at everything. I can't understand it all, and I don't know what God wants me to do and, and what he wants from me. I love Jesus with all my heart. I'm praying that God will answer me and help me. He feels very distant from me, and I trust his word that Jesus will never leave nor forsake us. But it sure feels like he has sometimes. Now, I want to tell you, you this guy, and I, I think he's listening now, you have not said anything uh, to me in this little note that you sent me that I have not experienced firsthand. I am not necessarily the, the actual details, but um, I have been up against this wall several times in my life. Uh, there has been some recent ones, but let me tell you kind of where I come from on this. And I've got some scripture, uh, that I'm going to give you. I prayed, you know, Lord, help, show me how to help this man. Show me how to, uh, encourage him. Show me, uh, what the word would say today. And, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just tell it like this. Uh, let's see, we're getting into, let's see, I can't, I can't remember days anymore. 2008. Um, in uh, somewhere around November, around this time of year, um, I was just such under a heavy burden, a heavy depression, as it were. Some people say, well, you're God's people. You're not supposed to get depressed. Fooey on you. I mean, if you can live your whole life and not ever be sad or depressed about something, enjoy it. Because most normal people have an oppression. And I've made mention before how this idea of oppression has the word press in it. It presses us down, depressed, oppressed, uh, things that are suppressed. They're, they're things that press down on us. And God not only gives us spiritual gravity, but he, or, or physical gravity, but he gives us spiritual gravity as well. I think there are things that are just too heavy for us and we can't bear. And in 2008, we had run a Christian school here since uh, somewhere around 1994. And my heart and soul was in that Christian school. I, I, I wanted to do that, and I wanted that to succeed just about more than I did anything else. Now, along this same time, God is, is uh, teaching me things from his word. He's showing me uh, things that I'm now giving out to people. Uh, and I did. I would do a few little seminars here and there, but... Um, but the things just kept piling up. And I remember going in, into that schoolroom. We had an ACE school. And I would be in there and I would just cry and pray and say, God, fill this room. I mean, we had room for like, I don't know, 40, 50 students. God, fill the place up. God, just do whatever you want. I mean, just do it. I, I want to honor and glorify you. And God knew my heart was in the right place. I wanted to serve God. And I thought, that that was how he was going to do it. And in 2008, when the school year started, uh, the attendance had gotten down so low that we, we laid off my wife. Uh, she worked in the learning center with me and um, w one or two others. We just didn't have the students for them. Uh, we, weren't, um, we weren't charging any tuition for the students that we had there, if I remember right. Maybe we were, but I, I wasn't going to make them pay it if they couldn't pay it. And um, so we had about five or six students, seven, something like that. Matthew was one of them. And it got to where I didn't want to be in that room anymore. I mean, at the beginning of the 2008 school year, I just didn't want to be in there anymore. And along the, about that same time was when Bradley first started coming over here, and he had got saved and, and was, you know, eager to, to serve the Lord in some capacity. And uh, I asked him, I said, would you mind coming over here two days a week and getting me out of this place? He said, sure. And he was glad to help. And so for two days a week, I didn't go in that room at all. I would be in my office and I'd study and whatever. But around November, I mean, it hit me hard. I, I mean, it absolutely hit me hard. Uh, I remember one, one night, one Sunday night in probably, I don't remember when exactly it was, but we didn't have an evening service at Bethel. And I went and visited an independent Baptist church about 30 miles from my house that I knew was King James only. And uh, I went and visited that church and with the idea that more than likely I'm going to start bringing my family to this church. And I'm not telling something that nobody around here knows. They've all know that testimony. 
And uh, my wife knew there was something wrong with me. And she said, what is wrong with you? And I said, I don't know. I don't know, but I just feel like maybe I'm done at Bethel. Well, my wife stuck her finger in my face. She said, I'm telling you right now, you're not done at Bethel. Okay. All right, then. Let's move on. And uh, But I wasn't happy. And what I did was, to make a long story short, I spent about three days in my office telling God that, number one, nothing was working, that I was burnt out, that I was, I was tired. There was nothing that was currently being done at Bethel that was seemed to be doing anybody any good, including me. And I said, God, you can take me out. You can put me back in. You can send me to. You can send me to Alaska. You can do whatever you want to with me. I don't care what you do with me, but you're going to have to do something. And I, I was fasting. I'd spent th- three days fasting during the daytime. I'd eat at night, but I'd fast again the next day. And it was just me wrestling with the Lord, God. I mean business here, and I'm not going to. I'm not going to quit praying until you do something. And I'd sit in my office and I'd try to come up with ideas of things that I could do with the church, that, you know, things how I could promote this or I could do this. And every time I'd write something down, I'd think about it for about a minute and I'm going, you know, that's stupid. That's the stupidest thing anybody ever wrote down on paper. And it was just, it was like that for three days. Well, at the end of three days, I felt the pressure come off of me, um, but nothing had changed. Everything was still the way that it was. And about two weeks later, it hit me again. There was some little incident. I don't remember what it was. And I'm just, I'm just going, I went back in the office and I said, God, I wasn't kidding. You're going to have to do something. I don't care how drastic he is. You're going to have to do something. I can't take this any longer. I won't. I'm, I'm not able to bear this. And so... God began to deal with me, and he, we began to deal with me. Number one, we, we decided to close the Christian school that we had run for about 12, 13 years. And uh, I felt better about that. Uh, we, we had a little bit tougher time making the decision to close. We had a daycare center, cause, and we were, we were employing some people. Uh, some of them went to church here. And, but it was in a situation where we were not financially doing well at all, it was draining money is what it was doing, and it was just going to, at some point, we were just going to lose it all anyway, so we decided to close it down. And, um, and I felt relief fr- at that point that I didn't have that pressure on me, but I still didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. And at one time, I even reverted back to uh, what, I, what I've done before. Um, I used to be a painter. I used to do drywall and taping and so on. Uh, if you need any work done, give me a call. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to call somebody else, but I know how to do it. I was out pricing drywall is what I was doing. I thought, you know, I'll, I'll pastor Bethel, you know, but I, you know, and, um, it was right about that time that God gave me the idea for the Watchman video broadcast, just like that. And I went, I can do that. And I already had, I already had a green wall and a camera sitting in front of it. I already had that. Because that's what I did with the place that we had our school in. As soon as we closed down, me and Matthew ripped all the desks out and I painted a wall green. I was gonna try to make a video, but like once a month. Once a, and I thought, wow, that'll be a lot. <laughs> and so anyway, uh, and the rest as they say is history. God took over, God blessed. I wrestled with God like Jacob did. And, I, and, and the Lord said, release me. And I said, I'm not going to release you until you bless me. I can't live. And, and it's not being sarcastic with God. It's not being demanding with God. It's not uh, saying, well, God, you owe me. God, you have to do this. It's not anything like that at all. What it is is that you get to a place in your life where you realize that you cannot live without God's blessing in your life. Um, let me read this to you. And, and this verse kept going back and forth in my mind. And I, I had no explanation for it at all. This passage of Scripture, which is one of my favorites in the Bible. Uh, Psalm 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth, 
shall prosper. And I, I would have that verse in my mind, and I'm going, well, you know, Lord, I, I know you, you know, you help me pay my bills, and and uh, we got a little money to eat out on every now and then. But God, I, it, it doesn't seem like the real uh, thing in my heart, which is not money, but it's ministry, it's it's helping people, it's preaching, and and trying to make some kind of difference in this world. That's what was really in my heart, and I, I said, God, it's not prospering. It doesn't look like to me it's prospering. And um, so then God began to deal with me about the things and so on, and um, I'm going to read some scripture, and I, I just kind of got four categories here very quickly, and this is to the man that uh, messaged me on Facebook. Uh, this is primarily for you, but then it would go to anybody else out there who is running into difficulties like this. And and I like, there's something he said that uh, I, I like it. It sounds like he's blaspheming, but he's not. Um, here's what he said. I really don't understand God. I love God, but I don't understand him. Now, I'll tell you this. Number one, we realize that God's ways are way up here and our ways are way down here. And God said, as far as, that, as far as the heaven is from the earth, that's how far my ways are from your ways. That's why I spent three days in my office writing stupid ideas down. I did not come up with the Watchman video broadcast. I did not come up with that idea. God said, I want you to do this, and that's what I did. And so it was his way being above my ways. And I just decided, God, I don't, I mean, I don't care what you do. But God, you're the one that's going to have to do it. And I'm going to get into that. The first thing that you'll learn when your back is up against the wall and you have no other place to turn to, you do, and these are simple things. If you think that I'm going to give you motivational speaking, seven steps, um, self-help. The Bible is not a self-help manual. It's not. It does not tell you how you can benefit yourself, how you can, well, let me, let me back up. It does not tell you how you can help yourself. It tells you how God can and will and wants to help you if you want him to. But if God gave us all these great things on how we could do this for ourselves, what good is the cross? And some people in their view of Christianity relegate the cross only to, well, that's what saves me and puts me in heaven. But as far as fixing my marriage or raising my children or problems at work or depression or whatever it is, the cross is not the answer to them. They're, they're doing what Joel Osteen has taught them so well, and Joyce Myers, is that they're looking within themselves for the answers, and it's not there. It never will be. The answer is the cross of Jesus Christ. And uh, I've, I've told people many times before, I think the book of Psalms is a medicine cabinet. And um, I, I've, I have taken many doses in my life. The first thing you learn, and this is, and you don't even have to learn this. This comes automatically. Um, when I was, when, when God broke me free of the electrical current that had bound me underneath my house, I didn't have to read a manual on how to cry out. I didn't have to go to an advanced training seminar. I didn't have to read Joel's book on how to have a successful life. I didn't do anything like that. It was an automatic thing. When we are in danger, when we are in peril, when we are, lo I've been lost in the woods before as a child. And you know what I did? I cried out. Listen to what the Bible says. Psalm three, verse one, when he, uh, a Psalm of David, when he fled from Absalom, his son, Lord, how they are increased that trouble me. Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God, Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice and he heard me out of his holy hill. He cried out. I mean, he went, God help. He said he cried out with his voice. 
And I, I don't, I'm not one of these that believe that you have to name it and proclaim it and speak it in order for God to hear you. I don't believe that. I think God knows your thoughts. I think God knows the intents of your heart without you physically saying anything. I go to bed at night and I try to pray myself to sleep, but I don't lay there going, now, dear God, please bless my wife sitting over there. She would, that would drive her nuts if I did that. But he said he cried out with his voice, Psalm 18, 6. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God, and he heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even unto his ears. And you stop and think about this. The cry of your heart carried all the way from planet Earth, all the way up, if I were to use Mormon ideology, up to the planet Cobol. Isn't that where God supposedly came from? And that's not real. But your cry went from this earth all the way up to the highest heaven. That, that's a good God. It's not that we cried that loud. It's this that God hears that well. Psalm 22, 4, our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. You know what you find out here? And this is Psalm 22. This is Christ on the cross. You know what you find out here? That you go back, you know, I'll tell you what's good to do. Go back and read stories of how God's people prevailed. Go back and read stories about how God's people had turned their back on God. And God, go read the book of Judges, how God's people turned their back on God. And yet when they were under oppression by the Philistines and the Moabites, they cried out unto God and God sent them a savior. And that's what he's talking about here. Our fathers cried out unto thee and you saved them. Go read stories of how God saves even the worst, most vile people, how God saved them. Psalm 30, verse 2, O Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. You don't need to go see Benny Hinn for healing. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. You know what depression feels like? feels like you're in a grave. feels like you're down in a hole somewhere and you can't get out. Psalm 31, verse 22, For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. I've been there. I have thought at times that there was no way God was ever going to help me ever again. I've, I've made too many mistakes. I've committed too many sins. And by the way, let me throw this at everybody. God doesn't help you based upon your personal righteousness. If that were the case, he would not help anybody. Go study the famous people in the Bible. Go study Abraham. Ask yourself, was Abraham a sinner? Yes. He was a liar. Go study Sarah. On the very day that she laughed and lied about laughing to God's face, he blessed her. What was the spiritual condition of, of Jacob when he went in and received Isaac's blessing? He was lying through his teeth. What was the spiritual condition of Samson when he took the iron gates and laid them on his shoulders and prevailed against the Philistines? He was in bed with a harlot. And all through this, I'm not saying go out and, and shack up with somebody so God will bless you. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying to you is, is that God gives us his blessings not because of what we do, but because of who we are. We are his creation, we are his children, and God, now if, if you commit a sin and you're a son of God, God will take a rod and whoop the fire out of you, and it'll hurt too. I always thought it was funny when my kids say, Dad, that hurt. Well, you're right, it hurt. I intended it to. But anyway... I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. And see, this is from a guy. I, he's, now listen to this now. I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. You know what that? You know how Joel Osteen would see that and Joyce Myers and all this other crowd? You know how they would see that? He simply doesn't have enough faith to get God to do what he wants him to do. He doesn't have enough faith. And so that's why God's not doing anything, because you don't have enough faith. And here is David saying, I'm cut off from thine eyes. God, you don't even see me anymore. And yet, nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. I am so, I am so sick 
of the world's witchcraft theology moving into churches and putting people under this kind of bondage, telling them that if they want anything from God, they have to perform, they have to have this super mondo positive mental image of everything that they want, or God cannot create it. That is the stupidest, most blasphemous thing that I think I've, uh, that I'm hearing right now. It's absolutely ridiculous, and it's biblically wrong. Uh, verse 23, O love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Mm -mm -mm. So that's number one. You cry out to God. Number two, yield unto God. Yield. Okay? You know what yield is? Um, it's when you pull up to an intersection and somebody has the right of way and you yield. In fact, I'll give it like this. In the, the rules of the road in America is that at a four-way stop, and I say America because I've been to Nairobi and there is no such thing. You go to a four-way stop, and they don't have four-way stops in England here. they got those stupid roundabouts. You just keep going round and round and round and round and round. You go to a four-way stop. The rule of the road is, I learned this when I was 16 years old, that if you get to the intersection first, you have the right of way, or in the case of a tie, it goes to the person to the right. And I have, when I'm in a good mood and I feel like being a nice guy, pull up to the intersection, I know that I have the right of way, I know that I, I have rights to move on through the intersection, but I will look at the person sitting over there and I'll say, go on now, go on. Have a nice day. You know what I'm doing? I'm yielding my rights. And I'll tell you something. As soon as you learn how to yield your rights and quit thinking of everything that you think you have a right to, uh, the guy that wrote me on Facebook, he had it right. He said, you know what I deserve? I deserve hell and I deserve it hot. And anything, I don't, listen, I don't care if you have the most miserable existence on planet Earth. If you die and go to heaven, You've got it made, brother. Okay, and, I, and there's, we've realized there's very little that we actually have to complain about, but we do complain a lot. So number one, cry out. Number two, yield. Psalm 34, 11, come ye children, hearken unto me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. When you hearken unto God, that means you're listening. Okay, God, now listen to this now. A lot of times God will bring you in this place so, he can, so you'll listen. We don't listen to God the way we should and he will bring situations about where we will listen to him and we'll do it his way. That's yielding. Psalm 81:13. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me and Israel had walked in my ways. That's yielding to the ways of God. Romans 6, 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And I'll throw this in here. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I'm telling you, not only does the Bible say it, and I believe it, but I'm telling you that it works. Let me say this, too. You know what God's righteous, you know, what it's, you know when it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, number one, I believe absolutely in the commandments, the laws of God, the ways of God, they're holy and they're right. Absolutely. What I do not believe is that you and I, by performing these righteous acts, that we merit the blessing or the, um, the hand of God laid upon us. We do not merit that by doing right things. When I see, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, you know what I see in that? The righteousness of God that is imputed to us as believers in the cross of Jesus Christ. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and not our own self-righteousness, but his righteousness. And when you do that, all these things shall be added unto you. When you yield yourself to the righteousness of God that he imputes on you because you believe what he said, then God said, I'll bless you. I'll give you, I mean, stop and think of it. The promise of Psalm 1 was given to those who, number one, um, blessed man, walking not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of the sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. 
Well, it's interesting that there's three there because there's three strikes in baseball, and I struck out on that one. I have done everything that God said not to do. So how is it that I'm going to get any of those blessings that God promised? How is it that my leaf is not going to wither? How is it that the things that I do are going to prosper? How does that happen? It's not based upon what I do or or uh, let's say how many sins I don't commit. It's not based on that. It's based upon I'm like Abraham. I believed God and it was imputed unto me for righteousness. So I don't think as a born-again Bible-believing Christian that I have to perform in order for God to work. I think I believe and God performs in me. That's the difference right there. Three days. Oh, I think I'll do this. No, that's stupid. Oh, I want to do this with the church. Maybe the church will go along with this. No, that's idiotic. Mike, it won't work. And then God, when I yielded to him and said, God, here it is. Here's my body. Here's my mouth. Here's everything about me. I'm yielding it to you. What do you want me to do? And that's that works. Uh, anyway, so you, number one, you cry out. Number two, you yield. Number three, the hardest of all. You want me to tell you what it is? You know what I'm doing? I'm making you wait on it. Number one, you cry. Number two, you yield. Number three, you wait. Psalm 25, 3, Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Did you know, you know how Christians transgress without a cause? They think that God has something for them to do. And then they go about in the power of their flesh to try to perform what they think God wants them to do instead of waiting. Oh, you, you, you go to the Pentecostal church and they say, oh, you're saved now. You got to speak in tongues. So immediately they start working you. Now say this, now loosen your jaw, now raise your hands up, now say something over and over, now get faster and faster and faster. And then all of a sudden now your stuff's flying out of your mouth and they go, Hallelujah, he's got the Holy Ghost in him. That's not how they did it at Pentecost. How'd they do it at Pentecost? They waited. Jesus told them to go into that room and wait. And that's exactly what they did. That when you transgress without a cause, you don't wait on God. You go about trying to do it in your own, in the strength of your own flesh, and it won't work. You'll look stupid doing it, too, by the way. It's kind of like you telling your three-year-old, don't, don't put your shirt on. I have to help you. And then the three-year-old puts their shirt on, and the arm is sticking out like this through the head hole. And you said, you should have waited. Psalm 25, 5, lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Who's going to do it now? Is it going to be you or God that's going to perform? And if you're going to do it God's way, you're going to wait for God to perform. I don't know who came up with this nonsense where people will say, well, I think God is waiting for you to take the first step. I think God is waiting for you to just step out in blind faith. You know who does you know who does stuff like that? You know who says stuff like that? The guys on TV that want you to write them a check. Because they've pumped you up full of if you'll just write me a check, God'll make you a millionaire. And they suggest now, oh, five hundred, a thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, and you don't have it. So you know what they're telling you to do? Here's our, here's our give, give us your credit card number. We're going to bill your credit card $5,000 because God's waiting for you to make the first move. That's a lie. That is an absolute lie. When did God save you? I want to ask you a question. When did God save you? 
Did you know the Bible answer to when God saved you is not when you decided to walk down the aisle and come down to the altar. That is not when God saved you. The Bible answer of when God saved you is before the foundation of the world. That's when he decided to save you. God did not wait for you to step out of the aisle first. God did not even wait on Jacob to choose him for the bloodline of Jesus Christ. God did not wait for Jacob even to be born. The Bible is clear on that. He chose Jacob before it ever happened, but it was based on his foreknowledge. I don't want to get into all that. But here you got people telling you, oh, you know what? God's obviously waiting for you to make the first move. God wants to see whether or not you're going to follow him or not. God wants to. God didn't tell us that he was waiting on us. He told us to wait on him. Psalm 25, 21, let integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait on thee. You want God to preserve you? Then wait. Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 37, verse 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way. In other words, you can look at other people and say, well, they're out there doing this. They're do That's what I did. I sat in my office and said, God, this church over here, there's corrupt as a, uh, there's strange as a $3 bill sitting over there. And yet they've got 400 members coming in their church every Sunday. How come that's not happening to me? Maybe I need to go out and do what they're doing so I can have people in my church. And God said, Mike, you sit still. Don't you dare do anything without me. I'll Mm. I'll get you. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. That's Rick Warren, by the way. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth. So number one, you cry. Number two, you yield. Number three, you wait. And, and watch this now. Yielding, you know what yielding, let me pull that intersection back up again. You know what yielding is at an intersection? Yielding means you don't do anything. You let this guy go. That's what yielding means. Yielding means you go, you can have it, okay? When you sit around eating a fried chicken dinner and there's one piece of chicken left on the plate, know where I'm going? And you're wanting it some kind of bad, but out of respect and decency, you yield. That means you don't do anything. When you wait on the Lord, you know what you do? Don't do anything. You wait for God to show up. You wait for God to do it. Then resolve. I am resolved no longer to linger. I love that song. I had to, at a certain time in my life, I had to have what was called resolve. I decided in my heart, God, I don't care what you do to me as long as you do it. And I've had to have that kind of resolve various times in my life on serious issues. God, I don't care what you do as long as you do it. And it was a fight. It was a struggle for me to resolve and say, God, it's yours. Romans 4.21, being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. If God promised it, he's not waiting for you to perform it. Abraham was fully persuaded. Romans 8, 38, for I am persuaded that neither death, that's resolve right there. You just got your mind made up. This is how it is. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in, there, here you are, in Christ again, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The love of God is not hanging on to the windowsill of the ark on the outside. It is being in 
Christ Jesus. And by the way, here's Noah in the ark. What is Noah doing when he's in the ark? Nothing. Going to bed, eating some fried chicken. That's what he's doing. Who's doing the saving work? The ark, Christ. 2 Timothy 1.12, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You've got it in your mind, in your heart. God, I don't care what you do as long as you do it. Hope that's a blessing to you. Susan, over at Facebook.com, sent me this. This is the second question I'm dealing with today. Uh, let me pull this up where I can read it. She said, can you help me with this? This is a website. She said, people are, you know, all these churches are going to tattooing now. This is a website of a guy that does tattoo interpretations for Jesus now. Tattoos and piercings might be considered by some to be a controversial subject. However, over a billion people on earth have tattoos. Oh, that makes it right, you know. This training is not necessarily to support the idea of having a tattoo. It is to help people understand hidden prophetic and symbolic messages in tattoo and piercing similar to parables. God is speaking to people all the time. In this one-of-a-kind online training, I will show you how to recognize hidden prophetic clues and messages about a person's personality traits, character, gifting, and destiny based on the tattoo or piercing design and its placement on their body. This guy, this is stupid. As an experienced and seasoned prophetic dream interpreter, I have trained thousands of people on hearing God and understanding their dreams. Now I'm using my accelerated learning process to help train you in this new and exciting opportunity. This is a limited time offer and it will not be offered once my new reality TV show and book on the subject is released later this year. So grab it while you can so you're not disappointed when it's no longer available. First of all, if you don't see the obvious commercialization here, there's something not right with you. But this guy, now this guy, under God, claims that he can train you on how to interpret. God's speaking. God is speaking to people through their tats. Look at that. Watch what I can make this girl do. Boom, 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 boom. Most, well, tattoos, the, the, the root of the word tattoo is, uh, it's a Polynesian term. And sailors, once they started going around the world, started running all of these Samoans and Polynesians and everybody else, people who did not know God. And they were seeing that, it, and, and even uh, those who came to the Americas, um, who was it? Pocahontas. If you've seen the Disney cartoon Pocahontas, you have not seen Pocahontas. Pocahontas was covered from tip to toenail with tattoos. They were done as a religious expression, but not to the same God that you and I serve. And so tattoos in their very nature are religious. Um, here is um, a book called The Exotic Art of Skin saying tattooing is often a magical rite in more than in in the more traditional cultures and the tattooist is respected as a priest or a shaman um and y'all know what a shaman is don't you they're untouchable you cannot if you cannot touch them in these religions they are untouchable and haven't you heard the expression, please don't squeeze the shaman? Well, that's where it came from. In Fiji, Formosa, New Zealand, and in certain of the North American Indian tribes, tattooing was regarded as a religious ceremony and performed by priests or priestesses. 
Um, here's a book called Tattoo History. The actual tattooing process, which involved complex rituals and taboos, could only be done by priests and was associated with beliefs which were secrets known only to members of the priestly caste or caste. Hambly concluded that historically tattooing had originated in connection with ancient rites of, of scarification and bloodletting, which were associated with religious practices intended to put the human, listen to this now, intended to put the human soul in harmony with supernatural forces. Now stop right here. When Applied Digital Solutions came out a few years ago, many years ago, they've been doing this for years now. When Applied Digital Solutions first came out with the idea of an RFID chip being embedded in people, they, caught, they marketed their product as something called Digital Angel. And the marketing of that, and I used to have this somewhere, I used to have this graphic somewhere of what they said. Digital, in fact, it's in the book, The Babel Conspiracy. The exact quote is in the book, The Babel Conspiracy. If you don't have a copy of that, call our office and we'll get you a copy, all right? Um, but Applied Digital Solutions, with their digital angels, said it's the connection between, um, between, the, between the human and the soul or something like that. In other words, there is a spiritual connection by this cutting and this mark that they put on you this implantable chip. And so here, according to this book, Tattoo History, it said that it put the human soul in harmony with supernatural forces and ensure continuity between this life and the next. Now, obviously, obviously, you're not supposed to get a tattoo. It's that simple. Um, and even, I'm amazed at this. Even the NIV Bible tells you not to do it. Let me read the King James, Leviticus 19:28. Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Now, here's the interesting thing. Print any marks I don't know but if I read in the book of revelations about the beast and the false prophet causing everyone to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead and then I see where God had told the Israelites don't print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. I, that's all I need. You don't have to tell me twice. You don't have to show me the original Hebrew. You don't have to tell me what this meant back 4,000 years ago. You don't have to tell me about some Hebrew idiom that you think this is or some tradition that they had or how the Egyptians did this or how the Samoans did this. You don't, you don't have to tell me that stuff. If I see a beast and a false prophet giving everybody a mark, and I see God telling us, don't print any marks upon you. I'm done. That's it. You don't have to tell me twice. It's, I'm good. Now, let me say this out of fairness to people. Um, if I have a tattoo, will I go to hell? Well, your tattoo will, but you won't. All right. I mean, your tattoo is going to rot in the grave and corrupt with the earth, and it's going to turn back into dust. I don't care how many payments you made on it. I don't care how you financed it and how many you got. I don't care. It's going to rot away. Um, but I'm telling you, don't. Well, I'm not telling you anything. God said don't do it. God said there's going to be a false prophet and a beast going to cause everybody to receive a mark. And then here God said, don't make cuttings in your flesh, which they used to do, by the way. They would, you've seen the body art, the piercings and the tattoos and the cuttings. They would, they would cut their skin and then it would heal. And there would, the, the scar was a thing of beauty. And that's how it is now. And God said, don't do it. Anyway, let's answer some questions, some emails here. Uh, this is from Tracy. I've come across Dr. Mark Verkler, whose ministry is called Communion with God Ministries. 
I'm going to tell you, and I've kind of read Tracy's thing here. I can tell you, stay away from Mark Verkler. He is dangerous. He's been on, um, oh, what's that old guy's name on TBN? He's been on his show a couple times. It's supernatural. He's been on there. And people are just eating this stuff up. He is contemplative prayer. He is automatic writing. I mean, he's doing all this stuff. He's basically telling people, you're going to write your own Bible. You, God's going to, you're going to get these visions, and God's going to tell you stuff, and you write them down, and that's going to be your Bible for your life. Uh, the email says he has a series of DVDs and teachings called Prayers That Heal the Heart, but I have really a bad feeling about it. You should, Tracy. It offers a Christian to be delivered from past hurts and demons. Can I, can I just stop? I want to make this easy again. If you're a Christian... You're already delivered. That's, that's the truth of the gospel. If you are a Christian, you are already delivered from these things. Now, does that mean that you're, not, you're going to be free and live in la-la land the rest of your life? No, it doesn't mean that. But these people build this idea up in you that you are a Christian, and yet you are still in bondage or still under a curse of some kind, and I have now the answer on how you can get out of this, and I'm telling you it's a setup. So anyway, it says it offers a Christian to be delivered from past hurts and demons. He says that all people have demons. Christians are demonized instead of possessed. In his procedure, there are seven steps. Why doesn't that... Why, that's interesting to me. He said, where one is visual, visualization of past hurts. You know what that is? That's an imagination. And the Bible says to cast them down. But he, she said, you go to these past hurts in your mind and visualize Jesus there and ask him what he, what he has to say to you. Well, why don't you just read the Bible? And the people are given a new vision, a new picture in the mind instead of the past hurt. Another issue is the journaling, how to hear from God. Steps one, quiet yourself down. Number two, focus on automatic, uh, focus on Jesus. Number three, listen to the spontaneous thoughts. Number four, and write down these thoughts. Sounds like automatic writing to me. And another point that gets me is that you have to pay for this teaching. It's not freely given. There you go, right there. Tra See, you done figured it out, Tracy. This is why it doesn't sound right to you, is that they cost you money. Only a little sample is emailed to you to watch, but if you want more, you've got to pay the price. You know what that is? You know what heroin we dealers do the same thing. Heroin dealers go to the middle schools and the junior highs and they, they give these kids a free trip on heroin. Why? Because they got them for life after that. Those kids will steal every dime they can get their hands on to buy more heroin. And this is what this guy's doing. And I, went to, I have done several things on Mark Verkler. And he is, he is a false prophet. He is teaching another gospel. And he's drawing people away from the truth of the word of God. And he is in on it. And... Um, who is it that does the It's Supernatural show? He's in on it, too, and everybody else who promotes this guy is in danger. This, that's how dangerous this guy is. He is leading people back into the, the, the bondage of satanic strongholds in their life. He's not, he, they promised them liberty, but they're making them the twofold child of hell more than they used to be. Tracy, I appreciate you sending that in. Uh, let's see here. Liz says, we cannot be careful enough whom we listen to. There is a page on FB, Facebook, that seemed very good to me with their comments, etc. Then I noticed that Perry Stone was in their list of likes. So I asked, do you endorse the teachings of Perry Stone? The answer, he's, he's my father. I about fell out of my seat when I read that response. How can they call him his spiritual father when the Bible is so very clear that there is only one father and he is in heaven? Great, great thing to share with us, Liz, and I appreciate that. Wesley says, we have a local heresy spreading that says that 1 John 1, 9 is only for unbelievers and you are to only confess your sins once really a pastor former pastor from a bill johnson friendly church friend of mine says that christians take it out of context because we fail to read first john 1 7 where it says 
and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. They lock in on the all sin, so you're not supposed to keep coming back and asking for forgiveness. I personally don't believe this. Well, Wesley, I personally don't believe it either. I can tell you, number one, as a matter of scripture, but number two, I can tell you as a matter of practicality in my life, I don't, I don't get away with anything. I don't. I, I, I'll say, I'll go back to my childhood. I had a good mom and dad. And I was one of these, I, my mom and dad were old school, and so am I. If you got a whipping at school, guess what you got at home? It was a double blessing, okay? A double whipping, a double portion. Why? Because they were trying to teach their child he wasn't going to get away with anything. So anyway, Wesley says, I personally don't believe this. I believe it is God's release valve for us believers to keep ourselves right with God in a path to their right standing. I would like to hear your perspective on this, that they may spark my study to refute this idea to friends of, of mine who still attend this church and are buying into what I believe is a lie. You're right, Wesley, it is a lie. Let me, let me tell you why I think it. Number one, number one, in 1 John, there is no verse here that says it is only for an unbeliever or a sinner it's only for them and it's only for lost people and if you're saved don't read don't read this it's not there it doesn't exist it says listen to this and in first in first john one uh let's see here verse five this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that god is light and in him is no darkness at all this, now, listen to this. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare it unto you. That's what verse 5 says. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And you know what? That verse is true. But if you want to talk about context? Put in the context of, um, of verse 10. Verse 9 and 10, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know why he said that in verse 7? To tell you that it's not your confession that washes the sins away. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that washes the sins away. That's what does it. And then it says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Listen, Wesley, listen to this. This is what these people are saying. They're in a sense saying that his word, since we don't believe that you should confess ever again anything, that they are confessing that his word is not in them. That's what they're saying. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. You know what, Wesley? Confess that sin, buddy. That's and repent. That's what children do to their parents. Sorry, Dad. Sorry, Mom. Caleb, bless his heart, turned nine years old yesterday. I love that little I love that little creep. He blesses my heart. That guy, he is he's different than the other ones. He's he's got his own way of doing things. And he does stuff that's wrong. And he knows when he has made me mad. And I have never had to tell him to do this. He will always come to me. Sorry, Dad. Always. And I, I listen, I am never in the world going to tell my own children, don't you ever apologize to me ever again. That's ridiculous. And Wesley, you can tell those people I said they're ridiculous. Anyway, Pam says, thank you for your part four series on the translation. I loved it. I appreciate you addressing how there is one ark, one gospel for both Jew and Gentile alike. Um, I liked how you said if there is some other way for the Jews to be saved, why aren't they doing it? Why aren't they being saved? The church I go to cannot explain to me how, this, how his Jewish people will be saved. They seem to believe that they will be saved in some way during the tribulation, but I'm wondering if they are uh, just like us in this day and age and have to be saved now before the end, would you be able to shed some more light on this? Now, uh, I, I will, and it's a very dim light that I have on this. I have the idea, 
just like, and I'm going to give you the example here, and I, and I kind of get what you're saying here. Um, number one, there are people who are saying that once we're translated, the Holy Ghost is taken off the earth. That's unscriptural. It's not said that way in the scripture. I believe in he who now letteth will be taken out of the way, but not off the earth. That would seem to indicate that people, and these people, and these people believe this. They believe the Holy Ghost to be taken off the earth, and then people are going to choose on their own without the benefit of the Holy Spirit to follow Jesus during this quote-unquote tribulation time. I don't buy that. I just, no, I don't see that in Scripture. What I do see, like with the ministry of Elijah and Elisha as our types, Elijah is taken up. The mantle then is given to Elisha, and he continues during that time. And so I believe that in order for God to save Israel, he pulls us Gentile church out, out of the way, and then he gives Israel the double portion after that. And I hope that makes sense. So that's the dim light that I'm going to shine on. That That's kind of what I see happening. And at that same time, God is also pouring out his wrath or his judgment or whatever you want to call it. He's pouring that out upon the Gentiles because he's done with the Gentiles. and You're done. Okay. So anyway, and, and she said, I found this interesting. Also, I was reading Mark 13 the other night. It seems to say clearly that the elect will be taken up to heaven after she says the tribulation. I know you said that we will be raptured at the last trumpet, and that fits also. Now, here, here's again what I'm going to say to people. Uh, what I've learned to do is to quit using Bible terms in a way that the Bible doesn't use them. And I'm going to challenge you to show me two verses of Scripture that prove tribulation equals seven years. Okay? That's what I'm going to, I, I don't think, I, it, I will already tell you, I would almost say, I'm going to pay you $10,000. I'm not going to do that. I don't have it. Um, but I've, I've searched the scripture. I've searched the word tribulation, tribulations. I don't see it. I looked for it. I mean, I went looking for it and I don't see it. So I don't call a period of seven years, the tribulation. I don't call it that. I may be wrong, but I don't see it yet. Anyway, I bet that cleared you up, didn't it? All right. Um, we're having Ask Pastor Mike Day. Maybe you ought to need to ask somebody else, all right? Uh, Chris says, hi, Pastor Mike. Thank you for your ministry and devotion to God. I would also like to thank you for taking the time to read this, and I hope this finds you and your family doing well. Yes, we are. Thank you very much. I had someone close to me give me a doctrine that said when we die or get translated, and go to heaven, we will obviously receive our crowns from the Lord. Now, that part of the doctrine, I believe, because the KJV tells us so. The twist of the doctrine that they gave me said that we will all have different crowns that will depict to others what we did on this earth by how many people were converted or preached to the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Is there any truth to this in your opinion? Because I've not been able to find that in the Holy King James Version Bible. I could be wrong, and if I'm wrong, please correct me. But that, to me, sounds like the act of works. I believe that every good deed we do on this earth is because God did that in us. That's exact, That's what I've been saying, bud. Not through my sinful and corrupted flesh. It just sounds like another doctrine of works on this earth. Please let me know your views on this teaching. Again, thank you for taking the time to read this, and hopefully you can answer this for me. You have helped me with a couple of other question marks. Uh, that I um, that I read this and hopefully you can answer this for me. Oh, uh, that I have had through Facebook and sincerely appreciate that. Um, God bless you and your ministry and uh, your family. And so, and by the way, by the way, I had a guy on Facebook, and I'm just going to tell you right now, Facebook is not private. There are things that as a pastor that if you share these with me in confidence, I have to keep confidence. I cannot tell anybody. In fact, it's, it's legal. If you tell me, if you come to my office and tell me some kind of sin that you're doing, and then I, I spread that outside that office, you can sue me and own me. Um, unless it's illegal. If you confess a crime to me, it stinks to be you. I got to call it in. 
Um, but anyway, I had a guy admitting on Facebook to two things, one of which was illegal. Okay? And the other one was just going, I didn't even need, need know that. And I wrote him back and I said, I'm going to pray for you, but uh, you need to understand that Facebook is not private and the things that you're confessing to me, I wouldn't want it out there. All right. Uh, Chris, uh, I, there is, there, that scripture and that doctrine does not exist in the Bible, and you're right. People like to use things like this to build themselves up and look at what I have done. Look at what I've done. There are even people who say, well, you know, he got saved when he was eight. He was a whoremonger and a thief and a murderer and a drunkard. But he's still saved. He just won't get the rewards that everybody else. Have you heard that one? Do you know what the reward of the saint is? Do you know what that is? You know what God told Abraham it was? You know what God said to Abraham? He said, I am your reward. So what you're saying is, is that dirty, filthy, nasty dogs who have no, no idea to want to turn back to God whatsoever, they're going to get to heaven, but they're going to have to live in the trailer while we live in, because of our crown, we are identified as the super soldiers for Jesus. Uh, Chris, you're right. Stay away from that garbage. Okay. Uh, it does not produce the humility and the meekness of a saint. It produces boasting and arrogance, and I want nothing to do with it. Tama, how you doing, Tama? Is the wrath of the Lamb in Revelation 6.16 the same as the wrath of God, which is filled up in the, she says, bowls, but the King James says vials? Um, I believe so. I think, this, I think there's one wrath, is what I think. Um, and I think... Part of the, um, well, what am I trying to say here? Part of our not really understanding the book of Revelation is that we have been told that everything in there is chronological. I don't know that to be true. I know it to be in order because God has an order. Um, I can't, and, and I'm not saying it's not chronological. I just don't know it yet. Um when people came to me about the idea of doing a Revelation Bible study, I didn't want to do it because I think there's more that I don't know than what I do know. But hence, you study. That's why we study, so that we can know more. And I will say that the Revelation Bible study has provoked me to do more study as far as what the Word of God says. Um, but I would have to say that the wrath of the Lamb, Revelation 16, is the same It's that's in the vials. I don't see two different wraths poured out, all right? Um, let's see here. Tracy again. First uh, Peter 4.12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. Oh, she sent this the other day. This is why I'm bringing this back because I thought it was a good question. The fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice in as much as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings. The question I have is, what are these fiery trials which tries us? Well, Tracy, number one, you've already had some of them in life. Now, I don't know you, and I don't know the life that you lived, uh, but I guarantee you have already had things. And you know what the fire does to silver? It removes the dross. It refines. It tempers. That's And God allows us to go through things like that. But I also believe, and from 1 Peter chapter 4, and let me just give you my little theory. This is a theory from Mike Hoggart. I think 1 Peter was written to show us that before we leave, we'll have to endure. That's what I think. And I think 1 Peter 4.12, the fiery trial, I think that's part of it. All right? Uh, now, when I, years ago, when I started doing Bible studies, I was doing 1 Peter, and I, was, I had a family that was just, I mean, all over me. How dare I do a Bible study of 1 Peter when obviously that's not written to us. It's to the Jews only. 
Stay away from it. You're not to learn anything from that. And you know what? Fooey on that. Because I read where the Bible said all Scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine and for correction and for reproof and for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It's in my Bible. Obviously, it's written with me in mind. And that's where I get my doctrine from. Anyway. Um... She goes on to say, for I've been going through such hardships one after another and can't figure out where it's coming from. Um, hopefully, uh, Tracy, you listened to the first part of this broadcast. She says, is it from Satan trying to destroy me or a curse due to my living with hypocritical carnal Christians? I have no choice right now. Or are these things a fiery trial to build my faith in a closer walk with the Lord Jesus? That's it right there. And if you are a true born again child of the living God, that's what he's doing. He is refining you. He's, you're in boot camp. You're in boot camp. You're being trained on how to fight. Lord, teach my fingers to know warfare, David said. Teach my hands how to fight. God is refining you, and he is training you for what he's going to do. Now, God, I started getting these wonderful things from the Word of God all the way back in 1998. All right? 19, between 1997, 1998, 99, I mean, the floodgates was just opened up on me. But God could not use me in this particular ministry at that time because I hadn't been refined enough yet. One of the greatest compliments a pastor, a friend of mine, ever paid to me, uh, Brother Lonnie Burks, the very first... Bible prophecy presentation on the King James Code was done at his church in Harrison, Arkansas. Very first one. That's where I first met Reg Kelly. And I was, let's see, that would have been um, 99, 2000, somewhere around in there. Okay, so I was, uh, that was, what, 12, 13 years ago. So I was about 33, 34 years old. Okay. Um I've paddled a lot of boats since then. I've been down a lot of roadways. I've been, I've plowed up a lot of ground. I have grown a lot of gray hairs during that time. And I have gone through a lot of fiery trials during that time. The greatest compliment anybody ever paid me is a couple of years ago, I was down at Brother Lonnie's again, and he sat down with me. He said, you know, Brother Hoggard, and Lonnie's just a great old, he's a Southern gentleman if there ever was one. He said, Pastor Hoggard, he said, you have matured a lot since I first known you. And I, t I just almost started crying then because that's what I've wanted more than anything. I've always wanted to be grown up. I don't think I'm quite there yet. If you see the way I act and talk, you know I'm not. Anyway, <clears throat> this is from Jean uh, or Jean. Dear Pastor Mike, is there any way through the scriptures we can know where or what Mystery Babylon is? Let me make it simple. Um, I suspect maybe, Gene, that somebody's telling you that Mystery Babylon is the Vatican and or Mystery Babylon is New York or it's Washington, D.C. or it's America. Yes. All of those are true. She has been Memphis. She has been um, Jerusalem. She has been Babylon. She has been all of these things. Mystery Babylon is the spirit, the harlot spirit of this of this earth, of this world. Um, you you could almost say that the earth itself has this. But we know the Bible is using female terminology in in relation to the earth itself. She has a womb. She has a mouth. She's bloodthirsty. She reels to and fro like a drunkard. And all of those terminologies, I think God intends to be on purpose. Mystery Babylon is a spirit. She is seen in the Bible as Jezebel, as uh, Delilah, as Herodias, as other different female characters throughout the scriptures. That's how she is revealed. But she is the antithesis of the Holy Spirit of God. Is she in the Vatican, without a doubt. Is she in Washington, D.C.? Well, yes, she's got her monuments up everywhere. Is she in New York? Well, it doesn't take you long to figure that out. But I will tell you also, let's say, let's say, Gene, let's say you go to a church and um, 
there there are multiple people in that church, including the pastor, having affairs all over the place. There's Mystery Babylon right there. Or let's say you go to a church and the pastor has the selected people from the congregation that he gives secret teachings to because they can handle it. That's Mystery Babylon right there. She's not limited to what the Vatican is, but she is behind everything that the Vatican is behind. So I hope that helps, all right? Uh, this is from uh, TJ. It says, Pastor Mike, here we go. First, thank, thanks, thank you so much for what you're doing. What a blessing your ministry has been to me. Just watch your series on the translation. Part four was beautiful, amazing. I get it. You know, thank you for that, TJ. Change of subject. Recently, I came across a teaching by Dr. Danny Ben Gigi, or Gigi, G I G I. He is promoting the Hebrew language as the holy language. I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. His teachings are everywhere, and one of my family members have fallen for this doctrine. And that's it, right? They fall for it. I cannot go along with it as he teaches that it doesn't matter if you understand the Hebrew language. When you speak it, and you, sh and you should pray in Hebrew, even if you don't understand the words. TJ, that is witchcraft. That is Kabbalah witchcraft is what that is. That is it's bad. It is very, 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 very evil and very bad to teach people that even if you don't understand it, if you'll just speak these words, then God will go, there's, oh, there's powers in this. If you'll just speak this Hebrew word here. Um, what is that for, for Pete's sake? This has caused division with a family member as they are now going back to the Hebrew and Greek in an attempt to retranslate God's word. There it is right there. It amazes me that people just can't simply believe the KJB. This family member has sent me a long list of words that she, um, she, um, Jean, the last question, Mystery Babylon is right here. Mystery, think, think about it. Mystery, blah, 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 blah. And I'm not just making noises. Babylon was called Babylon because they babbled at Babylon. They blah, 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 blah. Okay? Nobody can understand that. This is the epitome right here of mystery Babylon. You say the words. You don't need to know what they mean. It's a mystery. You speak the babbling, and, and God is going to supernaturally do things that he couldn't do in English. Um. The family sent me a long list of words that she believes has been mistranslated in the KJB and states that I don't recognize the Jewishness of Jesus. TJ, go back to this person and ask them if Jesus was so Jewish, which he was, and so hyped up on Jewish and Hebrew, why then did he refer to himself by the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. I am the Alpha and the Omega. And anyway, he goes on to say, and I'm promoting doctrines of demons because I refuse to stray away from the KJB as I know it is God's word. These teachings are everywhere, Pastor Mike, and it saddens me greatly. Just wondered if you knew about this guy, Dr. Danny Ben Gigi or Gigi or Guy Guy or whatever. Lady, uh, Master Guy Guy. And does say the Hebrew tongue is holy. Here's the link to one of Guy Guy's teachings. You know what? I'm going to open that up, and uh, I'm not going to look at it right now. Um, but anyway, I'm going to look at that later. Just need to watch the first few minutes, and you'll get the picture. Karen, oh, man. You know what? Just stick to the King James. Stick to it. Don't. And I wouldn't get in arguments with Jezebel here. I would not do it. You, she's not going to listen to you. All that she's worried about is getting you to listen to her. She has doctrines of devils and seducing spirits, and she's going to try to wrap your head up in things that you cannot answer for her. And so you know what? Just walk away, get your can of King James, open it up, and say, God, I believe this is your word right here. Now say something to me, and God will do it. All right? Uh, let's see here. This is from Joan. Hi, Pastor Mike, praying for Keith Crum. I appreciate that. Glad he's in the Lord and, and for you, your ministry, your family. I've donated blood in the past and received a blood donor card every three months for, quote, refills. Now, let, let me say this. I believe in donating blood. I think you ought to, all right? 
The new card I received has something new and says make a double red cell donation. I'll just write the paragraph that explains it. A double red cell donation allows you to safely donate two units of red cells during one appointment using an automated donation process. A small portion of your blood, less than one pint at a time, is drawn from your arm and passed through a sophisticated cell separating machine. The machine collects the necessary blood component and safely returns the remaining blood components along with some saline back into you. Uh, and then Jones says, if you or anyone know, uh, you know is an eligible type O, A negative, or B negative donor, double red cell donation may be ideal for you. I ask you, should we be concerned? Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I, the only thing that I can say is that... Um, Things can go, and you know, physically, things can go wrong. There was a, uh, there is a, 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 oh, what am I, a kidney dialysis center. You know, this is big business now. A kidney dialysis center up here, uh, and there was, I don't know, I don't know how many people was in the place getting their blood treated to stay alive, and um, something, all of a sudden, about half of them started getting sick, and they had to stop it all and take these people to the hospital. They suspect that the the purified water wasn't very pure and somebody made a mistake somewhere and i'm sure there's going to be a lot of wealthy people come out of this here before too long uh i don't know once the blood leaves my body i'm not sure that i want it back and so i don't know if i'd do that or not paul says pastor mike i really respect and appreciate the fact that you believe and use and the king james bible i was wondering why you preach and teach free grace and the new covenant but you also preach and teach observing the old covenant by requiring people to tithe this is not a new, now now hold on a second Paul let's be fair have you ever seen me hold a whip over anybody in our church and say you better tithe or you're going to hell have you ever heard me say that have you ever seen me do that require people to tithe I don't know if you observe what I do here at this church I don't even watch the congregation I make it a point I started doing this years ago even before the cameras came on just as a matter of protocol when they're passing the plate in my church I find something else to do with my time so those people don't suspect that I'm looking to see who's giving. I don't care who gives and who doesn't. And I don't, I don't know what your thing is with saying that I'm forcing people to observe the Old Covenant by requiring people to tithe. Is not tithing in the Bible? Yes. Is not thou shalt not commit adultery? Yes. Do I believe in free will offerings? Yes. Do I believe people should give? Absolutely. What is the best biblical model for what to give? There is no question in my mind that it is the tithe. 10%. It's, sim it's simple. I have... I never told anybody they had to tithe to go to heaven. Never told anybody that they had to tithe in order to merit God's grace. If you think I think that, you're wrong. He goes on to say, this is not a new covenant requirement for the church. I believe in taking care of the ministry, but by free will offerings as the new covenant teaches. I believe not just 10% is the Lord's, but 100%. Thank you. You know what? I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with that. But what I'm telling you is that if you want to give... The best, the best model in Scripture on how much to give is the tithe. It's clearly given to us. Um, by, and here's the thing. There, and, and I am, well, I'm not going to get into all that. There, there are people out there who say, well, it's in the Old Testament. I don't have to do it. Baloney. Anyway. Um, Paul, not trying to be controversial with you or sarcastic or anything like that it's just that you have never heard me tell people i believe in tithing i practice it i think the the people in our church practice it and i encourage them to practice it because it is the best model in all of the scripture on how much to give do i tell them that they shouldn't give more no that would be silly i've never told them to give anything or never told them that they couldn't give more or had to give more. I just believe that you ought to just do the way God said it. Linda, hi, Pastor Mike, would you please explain what, quote, he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not means in Psalm 15, 4. 
Uh, love my Bethel Church family. Trying hard to get out there to meet you in person. Uh, let's see here. Psalm 15.4. Let me open up my Bible here and see what this says. Psalm 15.4. We used to do this on Wednesday night every now and then. We call it Stump the Preacher. Let's read Psalm 15. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle, and who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly, and worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his own heart. Now, think about this now. This is going to apply the same way it did to Psalm 1. Who is it that is alone is worthy? Who is it that always walked uprightly? Christ. Who is it that always worked righteousness? Christ. Who is it that always speaks the truth in his heart? Christ. The thing is, you and I don't. We don't do it the way God requires. God requires it to be done all the time. We don't do that. How can we merit God's blessings? By being in Christ, because he alone is worthy. So, verse 3, he that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. Well, again, three strikes. I'm out. I'm not going to tell you about the time I shot the neighbor's dog. Verse 4, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. Okay, that means that you have contempt. Now, listen to this now. You have contempt for a vile person. In other words, you look at, some, you look at someone's lifestyle and you see the way they live their life. They are vile, they, they dirty jokes, they're into pornography, they're into multiple partners, they're into everything. And you know what? That is contemptible to you. You say, there's no way I want to live my life that way. In whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. Now, the question is, he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. In other words, you, you he, he, watch this. Christ did this. Christ did this. He swore before God. In thy book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. He, he gave that promise to God. And even in the Garden of Gethsemane, He's saying, Lord, I don't want to do this, but I swore an oath to my hurt, and I'm not changing it. Nevertheless, let not my will but thine be done. He promised that he was going to go die on the cross. When it comes down to it, his flesh is going, this is going to hurt. All oh, this is going to hurt. But he said, you know what? I came to do God's will, and even if it kills me, and even if it hurts me, this is what I'm going to do. Oh! Da -da 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 -da. It's time to leave you today. I'm just making that up. I don't know if that's the word for me. Anyway, good to be with you today. How do, I, this, was, this was a lot of fun, and I appreciate the questions that you've asked. Uh, even you, uh, Paul, asking about tithing. Um, you know... Do it because you love the Lord. Don't do it because you have to. That's the difference between the Old and the New Testament. The Old Testament, you had to do it. New Testament, you do it because it's the right thing to do. You do it because it's in your heart and you love God. Anyway, I love you. This is why I do what I do. So we'll see you next time. I recorded The Watchman today. It's about the Mayan calendar. Ooh.